All right, it's 12.01. We'll go ahead and get started with the introductions, allow other people time to join. Uh, again, thank you all for joining today. Good afternoon on behalf of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our monthly webinar series that discusses topics relevant to the government contractors. Our topic today is how to prepare your organization for the infamous CMMC certification. We have a very well-informed speaker with us today, Ali. Uh, he's the CEO of Blue Steel Cybersecurity. Our moderator today is going to be a board member of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce and president of Mobomo, Ken Feng. He's going to be moderating this session. I just want to welcome all of you. My name is Rina Bhatia. I'm the CEO of Proposal Helper and Bid Execs and also a board member of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you're not already a member, we encourage you to please join the chamber. In addition to our members receiving a copy of the webinar slides and recordings first, there's a lot of other um, things you can do. We have networking sessions, a lot of teaming happens in our networking sessions, so a great chamber to be part of. Uh, please consider joining the chamber and sponsoring our events. A quick disclaimer before we get started and I hand off the microphone to Ken. Uh, this webinar is for informational purposes only. There's no legal advice and no legal opinions. There are no legal opinions here. Uh, so please treat it as informational only. Please do not copy this material without written permission from the Chamber of Commerce. If you need to reuse this material for any purposes, please reach out to one of us before you do so. With that, I am going to hand it off. Uh, well, one more uh, housekeeping here. For networking purposes, please share your contact information in the chat box. The chat line is open if you wanna network with each other. If you have questions related to the content from today, please use the Q&A box so that our moderator has all the questions in one place. With that, Ken, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks a lot, Rena, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, taking a little time out of your Friday to join us. Uh, it's an exciting topic with CMMC, and uh, as you'll hear from our, uh, our, our keynote today, uh, a very quickly changing uh, arena, uh, especially with administration changes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick bio and then turn it over to Ali, who has been a, not only a, um, a business acquaintance, but a long-term friend. Uh, we've worked together through many different companies, actually. And uh, I, I truly respect, you know, his uh, deep knowledge of any subject that he uh, digs into. So uh, you're in for a treat. Um, there's no uh, questions that he, he won't tackle and, and give you an honest, uh, detailed answer if, uh, if he knows it, right? Again, CMMC is a quickly moving uh, target. So, But a quick file. First and foremost, Ali is a dedicated husband, proud dad to three amazing kids. He's a passionate entrepreneur, cybersecurity nerd, car enthusiast, data storyteller, and technologist who currently serves as the CEO for Blue Steel Cybersecurity. As CEO for Blue Steel Cybersecurity, a CMMC RPO, the mission is to deliver a new approach in intelligent cybersecurity protection, certification, engineering, and strategy services. As a CMMC RPO, Ali and his team work with the government contracting firm to prepare for CMMC Level 3, NIST 800-171 requirements. With 20 years of experience leading technology companies from tech-focused problem solving to the creation of consumer and business applications and platforms, Ali is great at taking what a small specialized group understands and communicating that to the mass market. So without further ado, uh, Ali, you wanna take it over? I do, thanks, Ken. Appreciate the introduction. Um, I have a slide deck. Uh, that I prepared for everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. And um, to sort of walk you through the subject. So um, I'll be the first one to tell you that uh, this is a evolving subject, right? It has a lot of directions this can go in. Um, 
And so what I'm going to operate off of is information that we have up to this point, uh, what's considered official. Um, and then there's some areas of speculation and, um, you know, it's really difficult to sort of respond to because at the end of the day, we don't want to work with uh, misinformation. So um, going through it. So what will what will we cover in this presentation? Um, you know, I want to talk about what CMMC is. Most of you probably already know. Um, well, so we'll briefly talk about it. Uh, the differences between the certification levels. Um, there's a lot of designations that are being thrown out there. RPOs, RP, C3 PAOs, um, applications that have sort of the uh, magic bullet solution to get you through CMMC compliance. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, process and timeline. You know, I think that's really important um, because, again, this is sort of, um, you know, scope for a lot of this hasn't been fully defined. And I can kind of share some of my experiences with this process and kind of give you an idea of what to expect. Um, diving into budget. So we get a lot of questions about budget. How much is this going to cost? Because, you know, a lot of the organizations that are trying to go for certification will have to upfront the cost. Um, so we'll cover those topics. Um, will it be required outside of DOD? Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the prime versus subcontractor role in this, um, we'll cover that topic as well. Um, and then I think towards the end, um, talking about lear lessons learned from the field. So I'm going to share a lot of the experiences that I um, run into while you know helping organizations go through preparation, talking to the assessors, talking to a lot of people in the ecosystem and, and uh, all across the board, just to see you know what what. Are certain things that are popping up, and there's quite a bit that you know uh, everyone wants to address and sort of help move this down the road. Um, and then finally, it's uh, karma points. I like saying karma points because I think you know my intention, um, as Ken mentioned, you know, done a lot of businesses, and one of the uh, rules that I always live by is share as much information you can to help the next person. Um, it sort of pays itself back. So. Um, uh, I also have a little bit of surprise to kind of give you guys a sense of my sense of humor towards the end. All right. Um, uh, Ken touched on this uh, about my background. I am, uh, I think the most important aspect of this is, you know, we, uh, as an organization and myself as an individual are part of the CMMC, um, AB ecosystem. And really it's just more in the sense that I've been putting a lot of primary focus onto this, uh, subject and really trying to assess um, how organizations can get through this uh, cleanly um, and efficiently. Um, we'll talk about NIST 800-171 requirements because it has been uh, in effect for a while. And so this is how it, you know, we'll talk about how that all plays into level three and beyond and just in CMMC in general. All right, so what is CMMC? Um, cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. You know, one of the things that, uh, as someone that's passionate about cybersecurity and just helping organizations uh, protect their information, um, a maturity model in, in most things is a really helpful benchmark, right? If you think about it in the sense outside of the requirement of having to do business with DOD, in general, it's a, it's a tool, it's a, a process that we can use in order to help guide our organizations to sort of roadmap our cy cybersecurity posture. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately the idea, the concept is great. Um, I think, you know, in reality, we should be more secure as operationally as businesses. It really just has to balance itself out, right? And, you know, part of this, um, a lot of the conversations and why this whole process is changing constantly is because, you know, there is um, a significant cost that goes into this. And we want to, uh, the AB is really trying to work out how to really balance this all out in, in conjunction with the DOD. And uh, who is the CMMCAB? Well, they're the nonprofit organization um, that oversees and, and manages the qualifying uh, or qualifying trained assessors, right? So when you're talking about C3 PAOs, and we'll get into that, um, the assessors have to go through training and certification. Uh, the AB handles that. Also, the AB handles a lot of the uh, submissions in order to get through this uh, certification by assessments. All right, so key items to know. 
Uh, CMMC will be a phase in approach. Uh, a lot of you might know this, might, maybe a lot of you might not know this, but the outlook of how this requirement is going to take effect on all contracts moving into DOD um, specifically is planned uh, for 2026. So meaning by 2026, the idea is to have all contracts carry this requirement with different level designations, depending on what the requirements are. Um, it was uh, The idea was to start in Q4 in 2020. I think that's pushed a little bit, uh, but we're starting to see some um, uh, qualifications and requirements coming in. Uh, they're requiring CMMC level certification. Um, you know, to cut to the chase, subcontractors will be required to meet some CMMC level, material level requirements. We'll talk about that later. Um, really, that's on uh, the uh, dependent on whether or not the subcontractor will need to handle CUI data. Um, and uh, if not, you know, there, there are other ways around it. You know, we'll kind of address that towards uh, the later half of the presentation. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of when we talk about level. Uh, CMNC certification levels, you know, what levels pertain to what type of data. So level one and two um, are related to FCI data. And so um, FCI data is really, um, you know, the basics of the contract, uh, co the COTARS information, you know, certain things that are not necessarily um, uh, pertaining to the uh, specs of the project that, you're, that is being worked on. Um, it's just more of sort of the basic, uh, I would say, more privacy, basic level information. Um, and then level three above is CUI. And this is where you get into content that's either generated by the government that's specifically uh, meant for the project or the, the, the vendor or contractor that creates the, the same amount of type of data as it relates to the project. So these are, um, you know, one, one uh, great example is sort of your, your scope of work or technical details of what you're working on. I'm, I'm sort of talking in a uh, technology context. Um, so if you're working on software requirements or working on technology pieces, uh, those have a good chance of falling under CUI. Um, and then as I said, uh, with any new program, expect changes to occur periodically. And uh, what you're seeing is the dynamic between um, you know, the private sector how, as it relates to DOD, and then you have the AB sort of in the middle. Um, a lot of people have a lot of concerns, questions, um, and they're essentially processing these things one by one. Um, the organizations themselves don't have a lot of staff and resources to sort of accomplish this as fast as they would like. Um, and I think, you know, as, as time goes on, we'll see a lot of uh, changes or updates to this program. All right, so let's talk about the differences between the certification levels. So uh, level one and two. So level one has 17 practices has zero um, uh, uh, policies or um, procedures that you need to capture. So what that really means is that you have 17 uh, technical requirements that you need to abide by. Uh, these range from different uh, controls, but basically these are, you know, do you have antivirus? Do you have uh, malware protection? Um, it's a seven, you know, 17 items. Uh, level one is pretty easy to obtain if you go through the controls and, and actually read what's required. Um, as it relates to level two, level two ups the amount of controls that an organization needs to abide by um, and then starts introducing um, processes into the mix, right? So these are um, items of, uh, I, I believe, about two processes that you have to include with level two. And then from level three and beyond is where all these uh, controls and processes, and, and, and from level three um, above, it starts with three uh, uh, processes, and then as level four goes to four, and then level five goes to five. These, these have to be managed. So uh, the difference between level one and two, it's sort of, they wanna know, do you have these items in place? And then do you have these sort of policies and processes identified? When you get into level three and, and above, they wanna know whether or not these items are managed. Right? And so the differences are uh, when you get into level three, each con each practice and each, and each process has to have two forms of verification to prove that it's in practice, right? And so um, it gets a little bit more intense. Um, as I've mentioned before, level one and two is gonna ha handle FCI data. Um, it's probably good practice since level one and two can be more of a DIY project. Um, 
for many organizations is, and level three starts to get a little bit more serious, um, depending on how these RFPs roll out. Um, you know, I always tell everyone, you know, be positioned to start uh, getting yourselves ready for level three. But um, in the meantime, work yourself um, from the starting position of level one and gradually get to level three, depending on your time frame and, and cycle. All right, so RPOs, C3PAOs, it all sounds like it comes from a Star Wars movie. Um, it's, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, and a lot of these accreditations are gonna change as well. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to the individual certifications. Uh, so we'll, let's start talking about what all this, these items mean. All right, so C3PAO, these are your third party assessment organizations, right? These are the organizations that are going to receive uh, your submission when you're ready for assessment, they have uh, what are called certified assessors on their on their staff uh, and go through the process, essentially auditing and going through all the items that you do submit. Um, they're the ones who are responsible to then interact or, uh, once they go through their assessment and once everything is completed and there aren't any um, issues with the submission or the assessment process, uh, they will then submit um, their package to the AB for final certification approval. RPOs are consulting organizations, right? Um, it's it's what we are, and I don't mean to diminish it, but it's essentially you know what we what we do is just we help organizations that don't have the resource capability of pulling all the pieces together, getting the technical staff, getting all the controls implemented. You know we're not. We cannot be the ones that do any part of the assessment for you. Um, we're the consulting organization to get you prepared and support you through the assessment process. So if a situation occurs that once we do the submission with the C3PAO and they find something that needs to be resolved, we would be the supporting organization to help you. We would manage controls. But um, you know how we are registered is we go through a series of uh, background checks. We do sign an agreement with the AB to make sure that um, uh, there is some accountability in our, our practice. So we wanna be accountable for what we provide as services to organizations um, and to make sure that we're providing the right service. That's really important. This is a very important topic. Uh, for getting certification alone, you know, we wanna help companies protect their information regardless of whether or not you're an R RPO or not. <laughs> the goal should be that we just gotta make sure that we put all the puzzle piece pieces together to to ensure everyone you know, is okay with moving forward. Uh, and sort of, I talked about this, you know, as a consulting organization, we cannot, RPOs cannot lead or manage assessments. So that's the role of the C3PAO um, and the certified assessors, the certified assessors that are on staff um, have to be uh, certified in the level that you're trying to uh, go after. So. What that means is that if there's a certified assessor that's only certified for level two, they cannot be the ones that assess your organization for level three. They have to be a level three um, at the same level certification that you're looking for or above. Uh, this is interesting. So um, many might not know this, but um, C3PAOs in particular can be RPOs. Uh, so they can do the consulting to help prep and they can do the assessment, but what they can't do is both for the same organization. And so really what that means is, you know, if you're ready to do assessment and you engage with a C3PAO for an assessment, they can't provide you RPO services or consulting services during the assessment process and then vice versa. If they're the RPO, they can't do assessment um, aspects. They have to kind of keep that separated, separated in order to maintain a, accountability. So uh, I get this question a lot. Is there a magic bullet that can uh, take care of all the certification leads, uh, or certification requirements and uh, all the items there? I'd love to say yes. Uh, what I can say, there are, there are a lot of solutions that take care of uh, a great amount of chunks from the controls, right? So there are some, some solutions that can take care of like 30 or 40 out of 130 controls when you're talking about level three. Um, so there are things that can really make this efficient that you don't have to have a solution for each and every control. Uh, but um, there isn't necessarily an app that can take care of all aspects that go involved for and 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 I'm as I'm talking, I'm really talking about level three and beyond. 
you know, level one and two is a little bit of an easier proposition where um, there are, uh, again, tools that could take care of potentially elements of it. But I, from my understanding, I haven't seen one that actually can take care of the complete picture. All right, so what's the process and timeline to get this done? All right, so step one is preparation. Um, anything like this, you wanna make sure that you do your due diligence, see what you have as far as current policies and procedures. You might be an organization that has a lot of this stuff taken care of. Um, so it's good to grab and, and build up your inventory and organize it. You wanna know what sort of resources you have on staff. Uh, that's, this is an important um, aspect to it because if you don't have, um, and usually I do a rule of three, uh, you have a CISO, an ISO. So CISO is a chief information security officer, so an executive level uh, person that can handle the information security needs for your organization. Uh, CIOs can also fill that role. Um, and then information security officers, these are sort of your managers in the sense of um, managing the program. And it's a uh, systems engineer. These are the ones that uh, individuals that would implement the technical control. So um, when you go through all the technicality of implementing you know, software monitoring, um, you want to have an engineer that's available to do this. And, and that's your basic team makeup uh, and seeing what pieces of that you ha already have and, and what you can actually dedicate to this. BD focus, so business development focus. Um, I, as a entrepreneur, I look at this as the, probably one of the most important aspects. Do you have something in the pipeline that you're going to go after that's going to require a CMMC? If you don't, then um, my recommendation would be to take your time to do the preparation for this. If you do, and you know the timeline is short, then of course you're going to want to start getting on this process sooner rather than later. But um, it's really important to know that part of this is um, being able to really uh, position the organization to go after projects that are going to provide you a return uh, on investment. And if you don't have uh, an opportunity in line, uh, it, it, it takes this process, it makes it a lot difficult on a budgetary uh, standpoint because you're, you're front loading a lot of cash and not really knowing how you're going to you know, see the return on it. Um, level and requirements. So, you know, getting comfortable with what levels are available, what level you want to achieve as an organization and, and get a, a general understanding of requirements. Uh, create a controlled implementation plan. So this is a little bit of, of something that we usually create for our customers, but uh, we call it the CIP. And it's basically a list of all the controls that are required for the level certification and coming up with, you know, initial ideas of how we're going to implement, right? It's, um, it's a long, long meeting. <laughs> and it's one of those meetings where you, it, the details matter. Um, it's important to go through I would suggest doing this internally with your key stakeholders just to figure out whether or not you have um, all the controls under, um, uh, I have an idea how you're going to handle all the different level of controls. And then doing a self-assessment. Now, um, there are, are different ways you can do that. You know, our company has, we usually give out as a lot of these self-assessments out to people so that they can start doing and scoring themselves to see where they land. Um, but there's also ones that are, you know, freely available um, that the government issues out, um, and then I believe the AB has out as well. All right, so then once you got, once you're prepared, it's now time to start looking at execution, right? Uh, this is really your build process um, for the technology-focused organizations. You're you're trying to build your policies and your procedures. Um, you want to make sure that they're enforced. So this is where your security awareness training comes into play. Um, you want to stand up the infrastructure so. Uh, what that means is that, you know, companies that initially come to us for readiness um, usually have the ambition to get their entire organization uh, covered. Um, we usually look at where they are based on the preparation aspects of it and try to determine whether or not it makes sense to do this organizationally wide, or is it better to separate um, and put a, an enclave together? Um, you want to be able to start thinking about, you know, uh, more, more pre-assessment drills. Um, if you're doing this on your own for level one or two or even level three and above, you might want to think about engaging with an RPO or a C3PAO um, on this. Again, uh, with the C3PAO, just be careful. Um, you know, you want to make sure you choose the one that you're going you're gonna to go with as far as an assessment is concerned. I have referrals if anyone needs it. 
Uh, but you want to keep in mind that if you're asking for consulting advice, you can't necessarily use them for assessment. And then step three is assessment time, right? So you have uh, done everything that you needed. You have your policies and procedures. You are a rock star with all your controls. You've got it handled. You're ready for assessment. You contact the three, C3PAO. Um, they start to begin the process for it. Uh, just like in an audit, um, they go through everything uh, that they can find. Um, if they do find things, you have 90 days to resolve any findings. Um, this is where the resources or um, whether or not you outsource this component, just having that support element. So if uh, findings do come up, um, you just want to make sure that you can resolve them quickly uh, within that time frame. Uh, step four is once uh, the C3PO has done their assessment and then they submit it to the AB. Uh, and during this time, the AB can come back with findings. And it's up to the entirety of the team to sort of address that those findings. Um, you know, no one has gone through this process yet, so I couldn't give you uh, an idea of what that looks like and what the probability of that is, because, again, this is all new. But there is a possibility that that could happen and having to go through a process of um, uh, making sure that we address those issues. All right. And then once you're certified, it's three years. So what that really means is that if you're in uh, any one of these levels, you have to still have the controls in practice, right? Um, so having a monthly support in place where you have a plan and you're continuously in practice and making sure that you are in compliance of every one of these controls makes the three-year assessment process. So what ends up happening, three years come up, uh, you have to gauge again with the C3PAO to do um, a renewal. Uh, again, no one knows what that process looks like yet because we haven't gotten there. Uh, but chances are if you have your um, you've gone through assessment, you have your infrastructure in place, um, you know, this should be a, a, a relatively smooth process, uh, fingers crossed, but um, again, it happens every three years, um, and we have to yet see what that looks like. Uh, timeline, six to eight months at least. So this is uh, going back to step one about the BD focus. So if you know that you're going to, let's say, um, hypothetically, we're, we're talking about a contract that we want to go after this year. Uh, we got to get into preparation and execution now. Um, you know, preparation takes about three months um, alone, and in some cases, and, and that's dependent on how many policies and procedures you have already documented, uh, what infrastructure you already have in place to manage, um, what does your enclaves look like for CMMC. We have to get all that stuff together, and then execution is, you know, standing everything up and operating from. And so you want to at least six months to operate off of this uh, new uh, setup so that you can prove and show that you've been operating successfully and that there haven't been any issues. All right, so how much should I budget for? This is the <laughs> most important slide, I think, um, you know, because again, it's um, as small organizations, it's tough to bear the bill on this. Um, and, you know, uh, for for companies like us, you know, we recognize that, and uh, there are many other organizations out there uh, that see this too. And how do we figure out how do we support this while trying to meet the compliance obligation? Um, so we're all trying, we're all in this together to try to figure out the best direction. All right, so preparation costs, right? This is for level three and above. Um, as I mentioned, uh, for preparation, uh, it's probably best for level one and two for organizations to do it on your own. This saves you a lot of, in terms of costs, especially again, if you have the resources or the know-how, um, you know, uh, getting a, a checklist together. And um, if anyone needs that, please feel free to reach out and be happy to provide that. Um, but normally preparation costs from what I hear from what we charge and what, from what I hear from other um, RPO organizations or anyone doing preparation costs, it ranges from like 10 to 30 K. Um, and it really depends on the size of the organization and the level of work. Execution. So this is your continuous coverage. Um, these costs range uh, uh, widely as well. Again, it depends on um, you know the size of the organization, the level that they're trying to achieve. But they range from like anywhere from like five hundred to twenty five thousand dollars. Why is that range such a broad range? Because if you think about it, you know one of the uh, benefits of looking at CMMC now, if let's say you're a smaller organization, you don't have to have um, many employees covered 
um, as far as a control mechanism is concerned, right? So if you, let's say you're, you're less than a 10 man shop and a 10 person shop, then, you know, ultimately that would mean that uh, people that would handle COI would be less than five and that you would have a separate enclave and you're only really covering like say two or three users, it becomes pretty cheap to sort of implement. Um, so there is a difference between taking advantage of your size and your circumstance now versus later on where if you have more individuals or you get close to winning a contract that's going to require a lot of people on staff, you know, there's again different ways to kind of price this out to sort of make it more affordable. Um, one note to mention here, it does not include internal resource costs. So that's an important one because uh, you have resources. Um, if you're a consulting organization, you know, billable utilization is important here and how much you're taking away from that. You know, these are all things that we kind of work with um, other organizations to sort of figure out because, you know, you want to cost this appropriately um, in order to figure out uh, the return. All right. So assessments, right? Assessments have their own cost. Um, so wide range, because honestly, no one actually knows. No one's going through assessments um, uh, officially. Everything is improvisional. Um, so it ranges. Um, one of the things that I have heard from in terms of feedback or concern from C3PAOs and assessors is that, you know, the, the, the more complete the, the package is and it doesn't have, you know, tiny little red flags here and there or things that are not really well thought out. The, the, the cheaper it's going to be. Um, I think that's true of most things. Um, and in this case, you know, again, 500 to 200,000 is a big range, but um, 5,000 to $200,000, excuse me, is a, it's a wide range. Um, but, you know, as we start getting the window, uh, the window of assessment process through, which is anticipated, um, hopefully sometime later this year, um, then, you know, we're going to start seeing these costs a little bit more defined. So um, I put this out there. Costs can be included in response to requires CMMC. Now, these are costs, and, and this sort of changed, but the official stance right now, uh, to my understanding, is only level one costs. Um, it was rumored that level three costs were going to be able to be um, included in responses. However, uh, the official stance right now is level one. Um, it might change. Um, we can talk about uh, there's a, a ton in, in the sense of grants, state grants that can help cover the cost. Um, there are different other methods that you know organizations can look at, look at to, in order to recoup these costs. Um, but the official stance right now from the DoD is, is that level one costs are um, allowed in uh, responses. Uh, and as I mentioned, state grants uh, programs um, are available. I know Maryland has one. Um, different states, depending on where your organization is based, there are some grants that are available to cover a portion of the costs um, in order to prepare. The continuous and ongoing um, is a little bit of a different subject, and it's trying to figure that um, element out. And again, BD is a really important element because you want to make sure that um, you know as your cost rises as an organization. From a BD perspective, you can start thinking about, you know, the idea of, of your overheads um, going higher as well. So, you know, even though the DOD is not going to specifically reimburse you for level three costs, this does become an overhead cost that your organization does have to support, regardless of whether or not it's CMMC or not. Uh, so there's some thought processes that can go into that. Um, so will CM CMMC be required outside of DOD? Short answer is all early signs point to yes. I'm not definitive on that, right? Because um, anything could happen, right? But um, as of February 2021, GSA um, has already started its preparation and guidance for CMMC and civilian-based contracts. Um, however this plays out, um, I know that if you think about it, the motivation of the government is to protect information, um, whether it's uh, classified or not classified. And you know we'll talk about this, but the NIST 800-171, the, the DFARS rule there has been around for a while, and that was the intent to be more you know self-guided and um, organization needing organizations needing to agree to it to live by it, right? So now CMMC is sort of the next step in order to really um, make this um, a real thing, and, and it's putting a lot of pressure. But um, you know, is this going to go beyond? I my opinion is yes. 
It's just, I'm not sure what's shape and form and, you know, what requirement uh, by when is going to take effect. Meaning does everyone have to be level three by next month type of deal? I don't, we're, no one's really sure for right now. Um, and then as a maturity model provides guidance to help organizations roadmap. So, you know, we, we work with a lot of uh, DOD federal contractors, civilian based federal contractors, but we also do a lot of work on, on the commercial sector. And, you know, it's interesting, a lot of people, a lot of these organizations are developing this, their security roadmaps. And I tend to reference CMMC just because it has, um, you know, the controls figured out as a level guidance, as a benchmark, right? And so, you know, I, you know, we're a creative shop, so we try to figure out ways to, you know, benchmark and develop roadmaps that are very um, digestible by the organization, because a lot of this means rollout, and that also has associated costs. So, you know, as a maturity model, it's a great benchmark for us um, when we when we talk uh, non-government DOD level requirements. All right, so does CMMC apply to prime contractors only? Um, I sort of uh, mentioned this and I said, it does apply to subs as well, but then the question really is, will the sub be handling COI data, right? Um, I know that there were a lot of subs that I've been talking to um, uh, their primes have adjusted things as this um, requirement has been coming out, um, either setting up um, enclaves of their own or just not providing CUI data, right? And so, you know, the question is, how will all this play out? Um, will the subcontractors still be able to do what's needed? Will, there, will they have to dial back their services? Um, these are still up in the air and in question. Um, some of the primes I know are setting up or gearing up to provide CMMC certified networks to provide access to the subs so that um, if they do provide COI level data, that they have some level of accountability or control over the environment and how the work is being done. Um, you know, the, again, these are all rumors. These are things that I've heard as far as strategies until the, the assessment windows open up and whether or not these, these processes get fully approved is yet to be in question. But you know, there's a lot of organizations sort of gearing up for this and trying to figure out, you know, alternative solutions. Um, you know, the other side to this is on-site work, right? So there's a lot of companies we do talk to that primarily do a lot of on-site government work. They're on location and they're issued government tech. Um, you know, that technically doesn't need to follow the CMMC guidelines for your organization. So if you have a lot of people that you have staffed, and they have nothing to do with your, you know, mainline organizational infrastructure. They are primarily focused on their government project that they're on and, and, and only have the government issued tech, then chances are you don't need to necessarily worry about it. It's only when they have to interact with your um, infrastructure. So, you know, one possibility is with a lot of us being remote um, and maybe you have an office space. If they come and access your net, the network uh, at the office space that's not within CMMC compliance and they're using the government issue tech, that might becomes a problem. So uh, there's a lot of things to talk about there and a lot of scenarios that can be played out. Um, but, um, you know, to make it kind of easy, if it's all sort of consolidated um, in that environment with these kind of conditions, you should be OK. And then I, I put down, how competitive do you want to be? You know, as subs and being a sub ourselves, you know, we always want to stay competitive, right? Um, yeah, uh, you don't, you, you want to make sure that you have a level of certification. I learned early on, the more certifications I can obtain as an organization, the more attractive I will become. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean that you have to be CMMC certified, but you know, for those who have gone through CMMI or through ISO certifications, you kind of understand the value of what that translates to to the impression of your uh, with your customer. All right, so lessons learned from the field. So I want to share some things that I've learned personally through uh, the process of helping uh, different organizations go through this, um, and hopefully it helps you. All right, so first lessons: once you start, don't stop. All right. So if you are trying to go for level three, you've hired a company like us to help you prep and go through the process of execution. What you don't want to do is go through preparation and then stop after preparation and sort of kill the momentum of all the progress you made on building your processes and procedures, all your documents, 
um, starting to plan out how you're going to handle the controls and making sure that you got everything in place. Because once you start the process, there's an audit trail with all the documentation you've created, which means how many, what sort of changes have you made? If you have a, a network infrastructure that you're designating as your CMMC network or the one that's going to handle CUI, uh, you have to do vulnerability scans on it just to make sure it's always in compliance and that has to be refreshed periodically. And so if you have a time gap, you have to provide an explanation to the assessor. So once you start, you know, the, the ideal scenario is just don't stop, whether you take it in internally or not, it's up to you. Uh, but um, you just want to keep, at, at the very least, keep the documentation alive that you created. Make sure you have the resources. We sort of touched on this. Um, resources are key, internal, external. Um, you know, the value proposition of keeping it internal is that you put a lot of the subject matter internal and you have it in-house. Um, it's easier to manage and keep track of. Um, you know, you can use those resources for other things beyond CMMC. If you do outsource, you have a cost savings. So hopefully the ones that are presenting you the, the uh, proposals are providing a cost sa savings as a added benefit. Um, but also, again, you can love a, you should be able to leverage those resources outside of CMMC only, um, you know, to, to sort of help your organization be uh, have a better security posture. All right. Um, forgetting CMMC. Uh, let's say you don't you want you don't care. You don't want to uh, do anything. Um, if you have a DOD contract, chances are you agreed to uh, the NIST 800-171 requirements, um, which is DFARS uh, the specific DFARS clause that I mentioned here. Um, this is important because NIST 800-171. Um, if you look at uh, level three CMMC, it's 130 controls. And this 800-171 is 110. So you're really, you have a delta of 20 controls that separates this 800-171, which you technically have already agreed to, versus level three. Um, I suggest if people are not really interested in CMMC uh, certification right now, and you do have active contracts that, re that you have agreed to def this DFARS clause, I highly suggest going through the NIST 800-171 requirements and making sure you're in compliance of those controls. The penalties are pretty hefty um, if you go through it um, and you might want to get that checked out. You do not need third parties to go through this. You can, there's self-assessments. We have them. You can go through it, um, especially if you have the resources, but this is the one important aspect I tell everyone, make sure you're in compliance of because it is a requirement as of today. Uh, we talked about this BD opportunities, identify the RF, RFP opportunities first. It's I, as an entrepreneur, business owner, I can't stress that enough. This is the ROI part. Um, it's important to really identify that to make sure all of this is sort of, you know, yes, we're trying to protect information and we don't want to leak it to put information in the wrong hands. That's a, that's a um, focus that we have, a passion of ours. However, there is a reality of cost, right? And so, um, how do we mitigate these costs? How do we put in a place where we're, you know, the organization is not hurt by trying to achieve these certifications? Uh, culture adoption is critical for level three. Um, you know, one of the things with these, these policies and procedures that are going to come apparent is when you go through assessment, the assessor will randomly choose an employee that's going to be handling CUI to, to find out whether or not they are practicing the policies you put in place. And so, uh, we focus a lot about creating policies that are uh, relatable to the uh, culture and providing um, security training around this. But um, if you're going to handle this on your own or work with another vendor, make sure that this is a key item that you work on. Uh, cultural adoption is is big and it's not as easy as just you know showing everyone this. They have to be in practice. Don't underestimate the controls. So what I mean by that is I've heard a lot and in terms of, you know, um, like the big names like Google and Microsoft are coming out or focusing on CMMC to make sure that their solutions are comply in compliance. Um, but you got to keep in mind, if you go through all the controls, they only cover a portion of this. So even if you're using Office 365, even though you're using a piece of what's going on, it doesn't cover everything. And, um, you know, that's going to become apparent for those that are, are feel like they're going to be postured to go through the assessment. Once we, the assessment happens, I think it's going to be something that's going to come out where you there's a lot more that you got to do 
Uh, in addition, especially when you're talking, and, and I should be clear, this is when you're talking about level three and up. You know, level one and two is a little bit of a different story. When to ask for help. Um, <laughs> for those who are C-level entrepreneurs, you know the differences or the example I mentioned here, legal Zoom versus a lawyer, right? Um, you know, Ken and I uh, talked about this, kind of joked around a little bit, you know, at what stage does it make sense to try to figure out the legal Zoom approach to solving this challenge? Versus when it's time to ask for a lawyer's help, and I would say if you know um, if you really don't have anything in place and you're really trying to build up the puzzle pieces here, um, you know the legal zoom approach to this you, is that you could use uh, different components. Level one and two, it makes this a little bit easier. You can take the legal zoom approach to it. When it gets to level three, there's a level of trying to take what you create as far as policy and, and make it. And, and introduce adoption to your culture. There's, um, as you go through the list, you'll see it's it's a little bit more challenging to take a legal zoom approach to it. Um, overall, one suggestion that when I get into this is I tell everyone this is a program, not a task. So um, there's a different mindset shift. This is more of a long-term, you know, evolving thing. Whereas a task is sort of a checkbox, and you're sort of marking, you can forget about it. Um, it's not a task. It is definitely a program. You got to treat it like a program um, to 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 make sure that you're always in compliance. Because as you're making investments to this, you don't want to work backwards. You want to keep moving forward and evolve as things change. And I've I've said this many times throughout the presentation. Level one and two, I feel are DIY programs. Um, I don't I don't think you need to hire anyone for this. Um, I am more than happy to help anyone go through this if you do need help. But um, when you go through the controls, there, there are a lot of solutions. I have a ton of them. Um, feel free to ask me. I'm happy to share that. Um, and then finally, these are some of the examples of documents needed for level three. Um, it's a lot. Um, and so it kind of gives you an idea of the things that if you don't have this, I'm going to kind of uh, pause for a second so everyone can see this. Um, but there are, there are items here that you want to make sure you have. You know, companies like ours sort of capture a lot of these things within the SOP, so the security operating plan, um, you know, and then other elements in the SSP. But there are some companies that like to make these um, individualized so that it's um, easily more refer uh, referenceable. All right, uh, questions. And um, before we kind of get to that, um, it's Friday. And uh, for those who are on here that know me, I'm Great with dad jokes. Um, we mentioned I'm a father of three kids. And I like to throw something out there. Um, I know this is a topic that's important for a lot of organizations. So I don't mean to uh, uh, diminish it, but it is Friday. So I'd love to introduce some humor. Uh, here's your joke. My friend just became CEO of a garbage bag company. And here's the uh, punchline. He got a hefty contract. And my hope is that uh, with everyone on this on this call that I've given at least some information that was helpful uh, because I would love to see everyone win their contracts and do it in the right way. Um, and if I can be part of that right way uh, in helping you answer questions, I'd love to. Um, and, and I'll leave this screen up and I don't know, Ken, uh, now is the time for me to pass it over to you. Hey, thanks, Ellie. That was fantastic. A lot of uh, information to uh, digest. So feel like I'm drinking from a, from a fire hose there. <laughs> so I really appreciate yeah. you saying that. Um, and uh, your contact information is up there. I appreciate you being available to our members and our attendees uh, for any questions, the checklist, that sort of thing or whatever. Feel free to reach out to Ali, take his information down there. We've had a bunch of questions kind of streaming in, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we only have 10 minutes left. Um, there's a question that's about what is the latest information concerning reciprocity for ISO 2000 or 27001 uh, concerning CMMC maturity level three? So I guess is there reciprocity between ISO and CMMC? So that hasn't. You know, based on some of the town halls, um, I know that that has been asked before, and the I don't have an official answer to that yet, right? Or they haven't issued anything really official. I think it's, it's something that they're still trying to work on, but if the person that asked that question wants to reach out to me, 
as soon as I find out, I can uh, reach back out and give you that answer. Or if anyone that's interested, please reach out. More than happy to give you the official answer. All right, sorry. Um, second one is, how does a home-based business that does not have any computer resources except for the owner's laptop obtain this certification? So it depends on the certification, right? Um, you know, one suggestion is to set up a cloud environment, right? Um, I've, uh, we've had some, you know, again, with a lot of these small organizations and, and everyone being remote, I'm just providing an example of this. It's not like you have to specifically do it in the way I'm, I'm sort of telling you, but basically one suggestion is set up a, a AWS cloud environment um, that is a subdomain. So if, let's say you have, you know, www.yourcompany.com you have something that says coi.yourcompanyname.com or is designated to that. Um, and, and, you know, one of the challenges is, are, is sort of the end user's device accessing this network. So let's say we're, we're still all remote and you went through the trouble of creating this environment, right? Your mothership that's CMMC compliant. But what do you do about the individual, the individual's um, Devices. Well, one way is to make them what's considered no memory devices, right? So they're all virtualized. Um, there's downsides to that, which are, you know, you have a really great internet connection, but no memory devices don't necessarily have to be monitored. If it is a memory device um, a system, then what I would say is, is that it would, should be issued in a rollout for the organization and it has to be monitored. So you'd have to go through a series of making sure that device is controlled, meaning this is only you know CUI related data. We're not going to put any anything on here that's going to handle or do anything else. Um, if it's in a home network, that home network has to be configured so that it's separated from the main network. I, I can bore you everyone to death about this. Um, I can get more specific if you need it, but there are strategies to do it. You just have to sort of um, architect it in the right way, and then it should be compliant. So another variation on the uh, reciprocity question. Um, I understand some of the requirements from CMMI certification and ISO will have a crossover, even though CMMC is cybersecurity driven and the others are more business process quality assurance driven. If a company is currently choosing between CMMI and ISO, is there one of the two that would better prepare an organization for CMMC? That's a great question. I actually don't know. Um, I don't know the specific answer to that because um, it really depends on the level of CMMI that you're trying to achieve. Um, with ISO, I do know there's a lot in terms of um, processes that you can adapt towards. Um, but when it comes to CMMI, it, I think it's based on the level set. I would say that um, let's let's separate CMMC into two different buckets for right now, right? You got your policies and procedures, and then you got your technical management of control, right? I think a lot of these pr policies and uh, procedures can be taken. There's cross pollination between ISO and CMMI. Just it's a matter of determining which, again, with the level question, the CMMI, how much sort of takes up uh, that you can kind of recreate or position for the requirements for policies on CMMC level three. Um, and then obviously the controls are a little bit different um, and you can kind of go through the control list, but that was a long winded, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but um, it's a great question. And if you want to follow with me, uh, give me a day or so, I can uh, figure that out for you. Thanks. Uh, we have been told that in order to achieve ML3 for CMMC, you must upgrade your Microsoft 365 to Microsoft 365 GCC or GCC High. Is there any truth to this? So this is uh, Microsoft's um, CMMC compliant like um, upsell, I think. So Amazon's going to do this. It's going to be like so with the, those using Amazon services like Gov like uh, their Gov Cloud. Uh, there are different services that they're going to try to position for this. Um, it's true if that's going to be your primary um, environment for CMMC. Uh, you want to make sure because, again, like I said, this thing changes so much. If, if they're positioned for CMMC, you want to ask the question, will you generate all the requirements in terms of policies and procedures that I'm going to need 
in order to fulfill that the requirements of CMMC, right? If they don't give you an answer to that just yet, I think they do. But if they don't, then it's questionable because you ultimately you, you're gonna, your documentation is going to have to cover what your environment is and their hive, so to speak, is your CMMC environment, and it, sh it should carry the documentation to support. Got it. Okay. Um, would you suggest a whole network scope? or a CUI enclave scope strategy? Great question. Um, so I'll tell you this, a lot of organizations come to me first and say, oh, I wanna be organizational wide. I, my first question or response is why? Uh, you know, do you have, like the question really comes down to is what do, you, what do you think your workload's going to be? Like, are you going to primarily handle contracts that are CUI and all staff included are going to be part of that? Or do you feel like that's gonna be a subset of your business do you do other work for civilian-based agencies that don't carry this requirement? The reason why I say that is because if if you're saying if you're if you're going to be organization-wide, then I think it has to be organization-wide. If you're saying it's not a major component of your business, I would suggest Enclave because it's less impactful, less costly, um, and I'm a big fan of sort of bootstrapping anything and and gradually working my way up as a return of investment and makes itself realized. Um, you mentioned some templates that the AB puts out. Is there a link or a website we can go to in order to get those templates? So cmmcab.org uh, forward slash FAQ is a great start. Um, as far as assessments are concerned, like the PDFs, um, uh, reach out to me. I can send you a link. I know if you search on Google, you should be able to find them too. Um, but if you don't want to do that and you want me to do the work for you, uh, reach out. Um, I'm happy to do that for you uh, and send it over. I have it on on hand. It's just a long URL. Um, uh, as far as like assessments and some some of these PDF downloads that you can get. Cool. Thanks. Um, there was a recent article that the CMMC is under an internal DoD review um, that could make some big changes. Do you know anything about this review and or how it may affect the current program? Okay, so um, at the very least, um, you got to think about what's possible and what really is a likelihood of, of, of all this, right? The whole intention of all, the, all these programs is to protect the nation's information, right? With these recent hacks of solar winds and then the Florida Water Treatment Center, um, you know, the U.S. is very concerned of cyber threats and cyber attacks, right? And so... Yes, I would say, you know, what could, you know, as a very small probability of this program going away, it's very small. I think it's like 0.000009% of it going away. Um, for those that are thinking, could this go away? Uh, but what's really occurring is that the administration is looking at this and trying to figure out better ways of rolling this out when it comes to costs and how organizations need to absorb the costs, right? You know, because in this 800-171 covering 110 controls and it is a requirement today, I don't think they're going to try to go backwards in that, right? I think they're going to probably start from that point and then figure out, okay, well, how do we do this? And it could be that some of these contracts that are coming out may not require level three. They may, may get one or two. They may try to ease up a little bit on that, but just don't forget in this 800-171, that one would them requiring them to, to pull it out of contract after so many people have already agreed to, you know, I would say at least go with the 110 controls <laughs> and focus on that and then see how all this stuff shakes out. All right. Well, thank you very much. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we're, we're out of time. Um, everybody enjoy their weekend. Thank you, Ali, very much again. Uh, and thank for everybody you. on the, uh, yep, go ahead, Rena. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to launch a quick poll here for our audience. I just need to check in on how, how we, uh, how, what our audience feels about doing a full two-hour hands-on uh, training class uh, if we were to do this through the chamber. So let's, if you, if the participants can please take a quick few seconds and answer our question, we'd really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Please answer the poll and um, 
as as I mentioned, uh, become an AACC member because you guys get the slides and all that kind of stuff first. And Ali, thank you so much. Appreciate your spending time with us. We'll probably be bringing you back for the <laughs> sure. Episode. It looks like there is a lot of interest here. That people are interested in learning, especially for the DIY folks, right? The CMMC level one. Just where do we get started and how to do it? There's so much information. Uh, it would yeah. be awesome to have you back. So we'll probably be imposing on more of your time in the future. If if everyone's okay with more dad jokes, I'm all for it. Hey, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all. So it looks like 90% are interested in our, in, uh, in, in having a two hour, uh, seminar. So great. Thank you all. Fantastic. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend.